Hello and welcome to the Wisdom Factory. I'm Heidi Hanlein, I'm in Italy, and today we want to talk about music, which is very much in my heart because I'm a classical singer, at least I was, and then a voice teacher. <laughs> and so I'm very much interested. And so far in the Wisdom Factory, we didn't do a lot about music. And so today I have Steve Banks with me here, and he will talk about a composition, Integral Oratorio. You know, I have sung a lot of oratorios, but not an integral one yet. So I'm really curious what it is. But before we go into the topic, I would like to pass over to you and tell us a little bit who you are, where you are, what you are doing. I mean, you are composing oratorios, obviously, but how come that you came to that and, and so on? Sure. Well, thank you very much for inviting me on. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I just thought actually we might um, start just by mentioning the Integral European Conference, mm. just in case we anyone is them. watching. Yes, we met mm -hmm. us in 2018. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to, if anyone's watching and is thinking about going, it's in May 2020, we're in February now. And I don't know about you, but at the 2018 conference, I had the most fantastic time, amazing experience. So I just want to recommend anyone that's thinking about it to go to the conference and you will have an amazing time and meet such amazing people, just wonderful people that were there. And I'll be there and I'll be giving a 20 minute talk about the, this piece as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll be there. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's that. just a little um, plug <laughs> for the conference. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I'm living in South West England in Devon. Uh, I grew up in London and I started learning the violin uh, from the age of seven. And my first job in the mid 1980s was as a classical violinist in London. So I played with, um, I was freelancing, played with many different orchestras and ensembles, including like the London Symphony Orchestra, Kent Opera, um, all sorts. Um, and then my sort of life has gone through, my, well, my work life has gone through various changes. Mm -hmm. um, so I have at one point been an economist and then I studied psychosynthesis and, beca and became a qualified psychosynthesis counselor. And it was there that I uh, first was introduced to Ken Wilber's work and the integral model. But all the way through, um, I've been doing music of different kinds. So I started with classical music. I then went into West African drumming with the djembe drum. Mm -hmm. And I was playing that and teaching that for a while. And then I joined a band called the Carnival Band uh, in England, which plays world music from all different centuries right back to the middle ages so that's my and then and and folk music uh, british and european folk music i still play now so my musical background is quite varied and i have quite a, a varied taste i love michael jackson i love motown um all sorts of different things uh so like you, I was familiar with all these different uh, spiritual, sacred music in the Western classical choral tradition. So mm -hmm. going right back um, to the Renaissance and then Handel's Messiah, which of course is German composer, but um, <laughs> in adopted by England, which is played, you know, I, I played the Handel's Messiah twice last December locally. Cho choirs love singing it still. Yeah. And then all these requiems, the Mozart, Fauré, Verdi, Brahms, all these magnificent, uh, inspiring, beautiful pieces of music. So I returned to classical music when, when I came here to Devon and I started playing these choral pieces again with the choirs. Mm -hmm. um, and actually coming more up to date, I also played Carl Jenkins' uh, requiem. He's a Welsh composer. Oh, okay. A living contemporary composer, and he also wrote a, a piece called "The Armed Man" for the Millennium, a, a mass for peace. So those two pieces are interesting in in so far as he's still setting the text of the Catholic Mass, the Requiem Mass, like all those other requiems. But he he made the interesting step of introducing other music from other cultures. So Carl Requiem's um, Armed Man has the Islam, Islamic call to prayer, just as one piece in the, in the one movement. And he also has um, Japanese poetry, 
that he set to music about um, Hiroshima. And also in his Requiem, he has Japanese death haiku that he has set very beautifully, I think, to music. So what I became aware of as I was playing in these orchestras with the choirs was that there's all this wonderful music. Most of it, as far as I'm aware, is setting still of the Catholic Requiem Mass or the Catholic texts. So I, I, I've been inspired by Ken Wilber's writing for nearly 20 years. And I just thought, you know, is there an integral one? And I couldn't think of any. Um, so I thought I'd try and write one. <laughs> and that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's an easy motivation, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, I, yeah. 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 That's how I started I, in the piece. That was in 2013. Mm, it's October a long time, no? and now you time. have these sample uh, recordings, which we can listen to, and which are um, published. Uh, the URL is published on the website. It's very, very interesting. And you know, before I didn't read your text about it, I just listened, and I thought, yeah. oh, there is Palestrina, there is Verdi, there is uh, everything. You know, I thought, oh, okay. I know that, <laughs> you know, and it came from all, all sides it came, but it was not disturbing in this sense because it changes, it changes from one to the other and without interruptions, let's say, it, it, it's, it's smoothly going into it. And I don't know if this is the integral part of it. We, I think we will talk about what is really integral. So far, I have noticed that um, there are many, many, any styles, classic styles and non-classic styles. And that I'm, I have always stuck, was stuck with classical music, so I don't know really very much about the other music, uh, but at least the classical I understood. <laughs> so uh, I'm really interested. I have listened to all of it. What is interesting that you also took, um, for instance, poetry, uh, rec recitation of uh, voice. In the sung music, as always, the text is not so obvious, especially when it's not unisono in the choir. So that's our problem of our <laughs> uh, music uh, genre, that uh, the text um, is always understood not so well. So it's good to have the text nearby. Yeah. But only, I didn't listen too much to the text. I just got uh, the impression of what I heard and I had the impression that it was often like a picture like as if you painted or draw a, a picture and mm. I got into certain moods into certain ideas what it you know inner inner images and and, and I found that fascinating so now over to you tell me a little bit what is behind that yeah well, it's lovely to hear you've heard it, and you, you know it's great. Your your first impressions is is um, is very interesting, and and it, yeah, it's exciting to hear your your impressions. The thing about the many styles, um, I had no deliberate intention when I started. Well, actually, let me start at the beginning because that's probably the easiest way to understand. I my first thought was. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't it be fantastic to represent the spectrum of consciousness in music? So one of my problems when I'm talking about this piece is not knowing whether the person listening is, knows about the integral model or not. Mm, yeah. So just in case there's some people listening who are not familiar with the integral model, just in very, very brief, Ken Wilbur was the first person, uh, as far as I'm aware, to integrate psychology and spirituality into a seamless integrated model. So we have in psychology, we have these di developmental levels going from infanthood to the development of symbols and then language through to a, a rational adult. And that's what Western psychology uh, understands, Freud and Jung and, and so on. And the, but Wilbur, of course, had then studied all the spiritual maps from the, uh, the great wisdom traditions of the East especially as um, portrayed by the mystics. So you have these two separate maps, the, the Western psychological map and the Eastern spiritual maps. And he, for the first time, he was able to put those two together into one uh, rainbow of consciousness, a spectrum of consciousness. And 
that to me was, I suppose, really the most exciting thing when I first read Ken's books was this, because I, I grew up in a very strongly atheist household. My parents were not religious, if anything, anti-religious. Mm -hmm. So I have a very strong, um, rational uh, skeptic about anything to do with religion. <laughs> and that's, you know, a double-edged sword. So when I found that there was this uh, approach to spirituality, which was based in a rational map model in the sense of a Western, my understanding of a Western theory, you could say, it was like, oh my goodness, you know, this is amazing. And it's been amazing to me ever since. It still is amazing to me. Yeah. So, so I could say, you know, one thing about my, my desire in writing the piece is that I introduce other people to this map. You know, I hope people enjoy the piece in its own right. But I really, my, mo my main motivation really in writing it is the hope that if there are a lot of people who don't know anything about the integral model or this whole new way of understanding spiritual spirituality, who will hear this piece and then go away and explore <laughs> afterwards the integral model and, and be, I think there are a lot of people, this is my sense, you know, uh, Ken and various other people talk about the, the number of people in the Western world, at least, who are spiritual but not religious. Mm -hmm. So they have some kind of intuition that there's a spiritual aspect to reality, but they won't go anywhere near the traditional religions because of all the mythic um, stuff. So I hope this piece, as a cultural entity, if it, if it gets performed, <laughs> um, will introduce people to this new way of understanding spirituality. So that's, so I started in October 2013. Let me first say something, because I think music in itself has this power to transmit spiritual contents. And it has always been used for, for spiritual expression. Yeah. So I think it's a very, very good attempt to reintroduce spirituality just by the power of music. And, uh, you know, you have the whole uh, ideas around it. Yeah, but just music in itself is a tool for, for reaching out to, yeah, the, un, how can you say, the unknown, the un, un, in, in, unimaginable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you can feel it. By the, by the music, you can feel it somehow, even if you don't find words, you know? So it's Absolutely. a really good attempt, yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I, I mean, I think for me, for, I, I can remember age 10, listening to Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony. Mm. And I was just blown away, you know, at age 10, it was like there was something incredible about it. That I couldn't say what it was exactly, but I was just so moved and excited that there was something it was saying to me. Exactly. And, yeah. And I think absolutely that's, that's why we have these great spiritual settings of spiritual texts. Um, the, the, the every, the, every composer and everyone who loves music, which is most people, knows mm -hmm. that music has this, we don't really understand how it works, but somehow music is able to, to take you into places in those depths and uh, into the emotions. And, uh, and, and I think, in, you know, this is one of my sort of ideas about music, not just what I've written, but music in general, that music is an integral kind of form. Because yeah. as soon as you have an orchestra gathered together to play, you have all these individuals, a hundred maybe, and the conductor, and then somewhere, somewhere is the composer who may be dead but the composer is not physically present anymore so you have this um group of people including the composer and the conductor and the performers and straight away you have um a holarchy in the sense that these all these um individual players on their violin or their drum they they are holes they are individuals but they're very much then a part of this greater whole, which is the orchestra or the band in the case of rock music or pop music. So anyway, um, I, absolutely. Yeah, and they play together in synergy. Yeah. They play together? They're together. 
they play together and they become a whole together become, like right. one you know they i had this experience too as a performer no that you uh, that you know the right split second when when you come in and when it's just a, you only have to look to the person and you you just know it and it's it's you cannot describe um, with words how it is but it is just a a field a connecting field which can be very strong very strong so that, that we have all the same how can i say the same orientation it's a, it's a stupid word but but we are yeah. doing our things individual things but together at the same exact uh yeah. way to form a bigger whole and the composer is there for sure mm. <laughs> because we are playing his music and we are trying to express what they express that's mm. it's yeah it's it's an experience i think which you hardly can have outside of music this right. playing together maybe football i don't know yeah. and soccer yeah. how they they might have all the team sports they might have similar experiences but music is think, very easy yeah i think it is similar i think that the thing with music is you know only one person is kicking the football at one time mm -hmm. whereas with music you're all playing the same music at the same time and like you say one of the the things is this how you just intuit when to come in together and when to stop together it's it's a yeah and i think the audience you know we didn't mention the audience the audience gets this feeling of the unity that arises out of this collection of people and that so this this sense of a unity that transcends our individual um nature is is definitely a big feature of music yeah yeah so so if i go back to the <laughs> the spectrum of consciousness yeah. Um, before I hadn't written much classical music. I'd written one string quartet before this. So it was a big, one of the features for me of writing this piece is it was a complete step into the unknown. I, when I started, I had absolutely no idea whether I'd be able to achieve what I wanted to do. So that's been one of the really exciting things for me. Um, anyway, I started with the spectrum of consciousness and it took a long time, but that was the first movement of the piece that I wrote, it's, and it's called Anamnesis. And it is a setting of the text by Ken Wilbur in his book, One Taste, in the month of mm -hmm. July. One Taste, for those that don't know, is Ken Wilbur's journal of one year of his life, where he just describes what he's doing day to day, like cooking spaghetti carbonara, <laughs> hanging out with his friends. And then he, in, he intersperses it with bits of theory, integral theory, and in, in this extraordinary section, which if you, if you haven't read it yet, is absolutely amazing to read. It's called anamnesis, which means unforgetting. So unforgetting is remembering. Um, so basically what it, what it is, it's a very short section of text, and he writes in the first person he had an experience as he was coming out of a very deep meditation. So kind of out of the causal, as he was emerging out of it, he had this experience apparently of 15 minutes where he remembered not his own personal life, but the entire life of the universe. So it's, the idea is it's similar to, you know, supposedly just before you die, you, you remember your whole life in a flash, just like in an instant, you remember somehow your whole life. It was similar to that, but it was 15 minutes and he remembered the entire life of the cosmos. And he wrote this down in these tiny little sections of text from the first person perspective. So it starts very amusingly. The first section, it just goes, push, pull, push, pull, push, pull, which is his attempt to describe physical, you know, the purely physical universe. And then it goes into the um, emo what he calls the emotional, sexual, the very primitive um, life forms, well, animal forms, actually. And then it goes on through there, through the uh, magical and then mythic, then rational and then integral. He didn't include the uh, pluralistic at that point. Integral, then psychic, um, subtle, causal, one taste. 
And basically I, I did exactly what he'd done with music. So I, I put all of those little sections to music. And obviously at that point, you want the music to, ev to evoke the feeling of these different levels of consciousness. So from something very animalistic through these sort of early civilizations like the, the Egyptians or you know, those um, mythic civilizations through to rational and then into the transpersonal realms and f ending up at the causal. So obviously you want different styles of music in order to evoke the differences between these levels of consciousness. So that's where the first, it had to be that there were gonna be different styles of music at that point. So what you're referring to is World War I, where he still thought that the uh, transpersonal and the, the, uh, the, let's say the spiritual development comes after the uh, psychological development, while now he, with the Wilbur Combs matrix, he has realized that it is, I don't want to say parallel, but it's independent in, in, you, in many ways, no? Okay, are you, um, are you talking about states versus Stages. Yeah, states versus stages. Yeah, exactly. But it's okay. I mean, what you are uh, uh, um, trying to show is certain stages and certain states. And that can be in music, you know, however you want to, to express it. That's not a theory. <laughs> you just, you know, and the feeling is there. And I think um, exactly the states, when you, when you are, um, let's say, uh, expressing when you, uh, this piece, one mother, one father, you know, that is a certain stage, you know, when you feel um, in the tribe in many ways, no? But it has at the same time the, the feeling of a state, no? When, when, when you go into, it, you can go with this, it's a repetitive uh, sort of song, no? You can go into trance if you want to. So uh, just to make sure for people who uh, are interested in Ken Wilber theory that there is a development of his thought. First he thought the spiritual um, development would come at the end and would be the uh, end point and then he realized that no, it is always present. The state, states can be with you at every stage, only what, how you express now, how you interpret your state experience depends on what level of development you are. No? Sure. So just yeah, political yeah. theory. <laughs> okay. And maybe I could, could just add to that, that there is also the element that was present in his early work, which is that um, spirit or um, God or the Tao, uh, as well as being the highest level of the spectrum, is present all the way through, is the ground of each level. So that is that feature is very much part of the piece in the movement that ends the first half, which is called Never Lost, Never Found, yeah. which is um, my own text, but it's basically paraphrasing, you know, what Ken says in those early books that you can never attain unity consciousness because unity consciousness is always the case always already um so that is a feature that i tried to bring out in the piece uh in some sense yeah so so the spectrum of consciousness is a, is the kind of a key structure that's in the piece um and it appears in other movements. The, so this anamnesis is, is 25 minutes long, which is, you know, it's, that's a big proportion of the piece. Um, and actually, let me just mention Evolution 5, which I think is quite an amusing little movement, which comes, is like, Evolution 5 is, I, is my attempt to represent the entirety of evolution, 13.8 billion years in five minutes of music. I, I listen to it. It starts really in the ground of being, in the, you know, the, the static uh, way, and then it develops really nice. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So my, <laughs> my main attempt in that, I used a spreadsheet in the composing that piece, 
because my <laughs> attempt was to, to make the, the music basically go along doing very little, very little, and then gradually wind up. And then exponentially, the winding up gets faster and faster. So it's this sort of exponential curve with the, the keys changing faster and faster, and the music gets more and more chaotic. Uh, and the funny thing is, so I worked out the time when all these things should happen in the five minutes. So the earth is forming after three and a half minutes. And then things start to get very busy with life emerging. Um, and then in the last couple of bars, all, all the animals emerge and dinosaurs and, and humanity um, is represented by the choir. And they yeah, and come it's in. A, just bang. <laughs> yeah. So the choir comes in, it's a hundred bars of music. The five minutes is a hundred bars. The choir comes in on the last semiquaver of the very last bar and they just sing I yeah. and that's the end of the movement. <laughs> so that, yeah. that I represents roughly a million years of mm. the existence of human kind of um, species on the earth. So I, yeah, I find it quite, was, yeah, quite amusing. It was very well done, very well done. I like that. <laughs> And I, I've yet to see whether the choir is going to be able to manage to come in and in the right, in the right time. Anyway, that's what starts the anamnesis. That's, so that's physical evolution and biological evolution is in those five. And then humanity emerges in that eye. And then the whole of anamnesis, as it were, expands that eye into 20 minutes with all the levels of human consciousness. So that's uh, that piece. But then um, there's a movement called sex. Um, in the second half, there's sex and then death in the second half. And um, the sex movement itself is divided into three parts. And the third part, I feel, um, I wanted to write a movement that would e evoke the sense that sexuality is not split from spirituality. I wanted to bring sexuality together with spirituality uh, in the way that I feel that um, all these Catholic texts um, that have been set to music before, they don't really mention sex. <laughs> um, a, a friend of mine who's a composer, a very good composer, Julian Marshall, he listened to the piece and I, I, he read my comment that I thought this piece was perhaps the first time that spirituality and sexuality had been brought together in this way. And he made the very good point that classical music does, um, in general, often evoke the erotic, you could say, you know, that uh, a lot of classical music. But I think this is, my, what, the point I was trying to make was that in an oratorio of the kind in which this is, this is in a tradition of oratorios with a, a setting of a specific text. And anyway, I wanted to bring the two together and in, a, in a, like a chorale, like mm -hmm. a Bach chorale style of music. So it's just the choir by itself singing and, it, and this little section is itself in three sections. And the first section uh, dis, uh, views sexuality from uh, the eye of flesh. So one way that Ken describes the different levels of consciousness is the eye of flesh, the eye of mind, and the eye of spirit. And that one can experience anything from these three different levels. That's dividing the spectrum just into three. So I called the second one the eye of heart rather than the eye of mind. So the, so the first little bit says, if you view sex from the eye of flesh, you experience lust, physical pleasure, like a lion rolling in the dust. The second one says, if you experience sex from the eye of the heart, you experience love, like a blossoming flower blooming. And if you experience sex from the eye of spirit, then like the devotee at the shrine, you experience divine union. And I feel that that little section with the choir, I, of all of the piece, I feel particularly pleased to, that, it, that something came out that I feel is fitting somehow. It's a, the music is clearly sacred. It's a, it's a, it has that sacred feeling. Um, and I think to bring sexuality into a, a piece which is very much about um, you know spirituality is I feel is a, a good step <laughs> forward. Um, yeah. So I'm so wondering, 
Okay, mm. did you plan to, to, to play some piece of the samples or do we just talk about the oratorio and you want to ignite the people to go there and listen to it? I think I did, that did go through my mind whether that would be a good idea, but I think the idea is um, if people want to listen to it, it's there on my website. All of the movements are there and the text, the lyrics is there. So I think it's the simplest thing they can just open another window and, <laughs> yeah. and go and have a listen. Yeah, rather than interrupt our conversation. And also, it would just be difficult to set up the audio to so it sounded good, mm. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yes, but please, my website, I, you might be able to see it on the screen, but my website is stevebanks.info. And there's a, a page on that site, which is Blue Pearl Listen. The oratorio is called Blue Pearl. We didn't mention that fact, which is the image of the earth. Yeah, I understood that from the, the image of the earth from, from the space. Yeah. So, nice. so you can listen to the MP3s of, of all the movements and read the lyrics. And even the vocal score is there if someone wants to sing along. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good, that's good. Yeah. So uh, you plan to to have a um, exhibition? A performance. A performance, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have set a date for a performance for the first performance, which is the twenty seventh of February, twenty twenty one. Um. And I've booked the hall, which is beautiful medieval hall here in Dartington, where I live. Um, I don't yet have a choir. <laughs> <laughs> so I've started assembling a choir and I have maybe a third of a choir. So it's not yet definitely, definitely going to happen. But I'm doing everything I can to make it happen. I need a choir. The orchestra is quite easy to get together because the orchestra can read the music and rehearse on the day. The choir has to rehearse for several weeks beforehand. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. And the soloists too, uh, there are some soloists. Huh? Yeah, we and have they... good solo singers. That, yeah, it's really the choir that I've got to sort out. The solo singers shouldn't be t so difficult to, to get, I think. Mm -hmm. Although I did find out when I did the demo recording, which is what you listen to on my website, that um, the piece requires a certain style of singing. Um, it mustn't be too operatic, which was interesting. I didn't know that before I heard the singers sing it. So they were they, these were classical singers who would sing the kind of pieces we were talking about earlier, and they would roll their R's. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's really fine, <laughs> and I you just laughed. Yeah, you, in England, there are so many good singers, you know, also for old music, maybe they are better to, uh, yeah, so. It needs to be. What I heard, I didn't, I didn't hear anything strange, uh, out of style, so. No, I, I stopped them rolling their R's. It has yeah, to be sung I mean. quite, <laughs> it has to be sung in quite a natural style, not too mm. melodramatic, not too operatic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yes, but, so I'm hoping know, that a, a very good singer is uh, a good singer is able to do that when they know it beforehand, you know. Sure. So yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yes, I'm hoping for the performance in uh, February next year, a year from now, and I'll also at the conference in May, assuming I get my choir in the next couple of months, then I'm going to be doing some crowdfunding. So mm -hmm. if anyone is interested in supporting the performance to happen, because it costs a lot of money to have an orchestra, then um, please go to my website and send me an email if you're interested in, there will be a crowdfunding project happening. Uh, I'm looking for yeah, sponsors, okay. people to help with the financial backing. Yeah. Hopefully some integral organizations, you know, will help to support it. Yeah, so do you want to talk more about the integral the integral part. You talked about the levels of development that you wanted to to express them, and also the the stages. Uh, what else would be integral? I mean, the mixture of styles is not yet integral. No, uh, that's ah. just a, a mixture. So what what does what is integral there? And so what 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 was the decision 
to 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 mix them and in which way let's say yeah, yeah that's that's a very good point about the, this there are these different styles so we could perhaps you i think you listed most of the styles earlier on there's there's like music that sounds a bit like handel there's music that sounds like big band jazz uh, also like uh, south africa uh, south american uh, yeah. also african <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah exactly and this to be honest i i didn't have an answer to that question for a long time um i played it to I played Anamnesis, that first movement that I wrote to one of my very good classical music friends. And he made exactly that comment. So you've got all these different styles here. So what is your particular voice as a composer? Where is your voice? And I was like, mm, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I couldn't answer that question. So, but I carried on, I carried on. And more music in more different styles came out. And I didn't know what what I was doing. Really, I didn't have a plan. I was just, I was just doing what came intuitively, really. Mm -hmm. And then I think it was quite a long time after I finished the whole piece that the answer came. And I'm not sure how good an answer it is, to be honest. The only answer about whether the collection of different styles ends up integrated that question will only really be answered in the first performance. So, but this is my answer for you. I'll tell you now, this is my answer. So the integral model takes all these different uh, areas of human map making, of human knowledge, psychology, spirituality, religion, science, economics, education, all of those different things and, and links them together. Right? That's the, that's the essence of the integral model, this meta map. So, so it makes sense that a piece of music that is trying to give a sense of that map should include different styles of music. Okay, that, I think that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. And so the only remaining question then really is whether the music fits together in the way that the integral map clearly fits together that's its defining characteristic it's not just a heap of different kinds of knowledge it links them in a very particular way with the spectrum of consciousness states the quadrants types and the shadow so i'll, I'll tell you one of the uh integrate there are two for, i think for my to my mind as yet maybe more answers will come about this but there are two specific things about this piece which uh, integrate the different bits. One is silence. I heard that. The silence. Yeah. <laughs> you heard it be on the when you listen to the MP3s. You won't hear the silence nearly as powerfully as you'll hear it in the performance. Mm -hmm. So there are three, I think, four movements, uh, including um, the sex one, the death one, a movement called Let Go. And amnesis itself, several times, the music goes from a sort of loud, busy state into quieter, quieter, more subtle, more subtle um, types of music and finishes with a gong or just silence. Exactly, because I had written it down and now I don't find my, <laughs> <laughs> my paper where I noticed the silence, where I said, oh, yeah, that is part of the music, you know? Yeah. Really. It's gone. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it happens several times. So, mm -hmm. you know, at the integral conference in May, we're going to be going through the U process with Otto Sharma, mm -hmm. which is used for organizations, right? Or, or for, for groups of people that want to discover something new, a new way of understanding a problem. And you have this U curve where you descend, you get to this bottom of the U, which is the place where you're open to new possibilities. You're open to spirit. You're open to, you're letting go of what your current identities and disidentifying in order to allow something new to emerge. Bottom of the U and then you go back up the U in order to um, turn those new understandings into crystallized uh, things. This, I, I was at the, the IEC recom, what's it called? The regathering in mm -hmm. May last year. And we were talking about the U 
Otto Sharma's you. And I realized that my piece is like a series of views. It's a series of descents going down and each one goes further down and further down until you get to death, which is in the second half near the end of the piece. You have this movement called death, um, which has a big build up to this, this, the pain of death, the pain, the sorrow, the loss, you know, this huge um, grief and difficulty that we have with death. And, it, and the music suddenly stops and just left with a very quiet note on the violins. And then what is portrayed then is the mystical understanding of death. Uh, in other words, the unity, the underlying unity of birth and death that the mystics understand. And that music is already quiet. And it has the phrase, um, Honcho Myoshu, which Ken quotes in his book, No Boundary. Honcho Myoshu, which is the phrase from um, Japanese Zen um, meditation, and roughly means, uh, I always get muddled about the words here, but something like, um, uh, wondrous is to, the, the idea that when you sit to meditate you're not trying to a, attain something your meditation is a, an expression of your already enlightened nature the so, honcho myoshu is the the idea is saying you you are now awake you are your fundamental nature is buddha nature your fundamental nature is christ consciousness you sitting here listening to this music are awake now and peace is here now it's not to be found somewhere else in some other time some other place it's now so the music is, is the choir is singing that and the music is already quite it goes into quieter and quieter and quieter into silence the gong and then from the gong just into silence and at that moment, there's going to be in the performance a substantial piece of silence, maybe 30 seconds or a minute. And then the next movement is called Be Still. And that's essentially um, a setting, a very quiet, very simple setting to music of meditation instructions, which I heard actually in ni about 1990 from a very well-known Tibetan uh, Rinpoche, and he had this beautiful three-part summary of meditation. And I paraphrased it and put it into this very simple song called Be Still. That song then fades into silence. And after that, there's a movement which is just silence. There is a, one movement of the piece, which is going to be either a minimum of a minute long, but maybe three minutes long, or maybe four minutes, 33 seconds. <laughs> Does that mean anything to you? No. Okay. There's a very famous piece of classical music, which is called Four Minutes, 33 Seconds, which is by the American composer, John Cage. Ah, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Who was working in the, 19, in the alternative scene in 1960. He was influenced by um, Suzuki, the first Japanese teacher of Zen to come to America. He went to lectures by Suzuki. So he was a very avant-garde composer and one of his most famous pieces is four minutes, 33 seconds. And it's just, there is no music. So the performer comes onto the stage, say with a the piano, they sit at the piano, open the lid, and then they just sit there, do nothing. And you can see it on YouTube. You can, you can see performances of, by a whole orchestra of, <laughs> of this piece. So it's quite amusing to me that, you know, this movement in my piece, is just silence. And I think, well, I'm quoting John Cage, <laughs> but I don't think there's any copyright. <laughs> <laughs> you have it, Mr. Strange. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the music is, is, the whole piece is an invitation in a way to meditation. And one way to think of my, of this piece, this Blue Pearl Oratorio is like a guided meditation. So it guides you through all these levels of your being, the consciousness from the animalistic elements of your being through the rational to the transpersonal and the right through to God, to, to spirit. And this repeated 
descent into silence is, I think, clearly an integrating factor. So my hope is that by the time it gets to this death, be still, which is the, the, the deepest point in the music, I, I hope, and I really imagine, to be honest, that a lot of people will be experiencing something very profound at that point in that stillness and in the silence. Um, so that is a big integrating factor. The fact that whatever music is going on, there's always the silence. And it's, that's the same thing, in, that's, I think putting in musical terms, the idea that whatever is going on in your life, whatever, if you're in the most sublime, blissful state in meditation, or whether you've just had a big row with your partner and you're in a terrible, angry mood, whatever is going on in your life, it is the work of God. You, you are, your Buddha nature is expressing itself through that particular state. It doesn't go away. You can't escape it. And I think that's one of the things that I'm really hoping to convey with this piece of music is, you know, with all the, the Catholic texts, the requiem, the peace that they're talking about is for the dead. It's, it's let's hope that when we die, we experience peace. Brahms said very explicitly about his requiem that it was more about the living. It was, he was hoping that his music would console the living, which I think is beautiful. And Howard Goodhall, an English composer, when he wrote his requiem, he, he was not a religious, he is still alive, he's not a religious person. And he said he hoped his piece, uh, requiem, eternal light, would, would be consoling for the living, the people that hear it. My piece, the requiem in my piece is not supposed to be consoling. It's supposed to be just pointing out the fact that it is here in every moment of your life if you turn towards it. Like Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings, peace is every step. You don't attain peace. You don't attain Buddha nature. You don't attain find God. God is everything that's always happening. So this, I think that going into the silence in the music is, is a, I hope that people experience something like that during the performance, a, a, a peak experience, if you like, or a, a depth experience. Um, I imagine that that could happen because it feels like uh, a guidance to inner states. Yeah. No? I, I felt it from the first piece on. I thought, oh, yeah, okay, there's something happening. And then comes the rational mind and says, oh, this is Verdi, or this is that and that, you know. But, but when yeah. you really uh, allow yourself to go into it, you, you, you can feel it, you know, that right. there is something guiding you somewhere. So you say peace is everywhere, everything is, is um, spiritual, which it is, but not everybody has an access to it and not an immediate access. And that music can, as the, the other music, not all, but many of the music pieces can have the power to lead you into it. And I think yours is a good example that it can lead into you finding an access into, into the, um, yeah, I don't want to say feeling component. It is not only feeling, it's also intuition that's also contact with your inner self you know it's not just feeling it's, just, mm. it's more more of it but we need to be open for that if if, mm. if, if you know it's always the the orange mind thinking thinking oh now he's doing this now he's doing this now he's doing it. you lose out <laughs> all the all the experience so but you know a piece is long enough so maybe after the case people will finally yeah. get into this because it's a good occasion to to do a meditation you know and not by chance uh, music is used with meditation you know and direct into a certain direction and which is great yeah yeah absolutely yeah so i suppose that yeah in terms of what integrates there is another element i um that integrates in the music, which is um, 
the sort of thing that Wagner did with his light motifs in the in the ring, the cycle of the ring. So there are two main melodic themes that recur through the piece. So the the, um, the little motif you hear in the strings right at the beginning, which is um, da 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 da. You hear that little motif, and then that comes again in the fugue that immediately follows it. Da 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 You hear that tune. That tune is then recycled uh, right at the end in the in the Potter, and it's moved by one beat, but it's essentially the same melody. So you, that kind of you hear at the beginning and at the end. And the other one is the the theme of of uh, Blue Pearl. So. The song Blue Pearl I wrote a long time before I started writing this piece, uh, a long time ago. And it has, it's, it sounds a bit African. It's based on a riff, a recurring riff, which is dum da 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 Boom, blue pearl, I turn and I turn. One world, I learn and I learn. So that's very repetitive. It goes through that piece. And that movement is the earth, the earth speaking to human beings saying we are one. That we, we human beings are not separate from the earth, we are the earth. Um, and that's, that movement has given its title to the whole oratorio, Blue Pearl, a one world oratorio. So that tune, that theme, um, I used again in the Evolution 5 when the earth forms mm -hmm. at three and a half minutes, you hear that same theme. You hear dum ba da da dum da 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 dum dum, and you hear it again in a movement called holarchy, which is uh, starting from quarks, atoms, molecules, and going all the way to through human beings, and then the Earth, the solar system, and ending up at the entire cosmos. You hear it again when the Earth comes in. Dum da 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 dum da da. So these are also integrating factors, you could say, in the music. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's one other, a uh, third factor that's integrating in the music. You talked about how it changes a lot, the music, the style. The key, the key signatures change a lot as well. That's one of the fe features. I didn't, I didn't set out to do that, but looking back at it, I realized that the, the, the way I use key signatures intuitively, often they change a lot and quite quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's another factor that is common through the piece. And I... I'm going to talk about that more at the conference, this specific way I use key signatures. Um, and I think that's a fascinating thing about, you know, how in Western music, in, in most music, the key signature gives a sense of home, a sense of, a, you know, this is the key we're in. And then you might move, in classical music, you might move away from that key to some other key, and then you move back again. So you have this sense of this is home, and then you move away, go through some other keys, and then you come back home. Uh, but in in in, Hola, in in my piece, there are several movements where the key changes more in a more unsettling way, so that you mm -hmm. lose your sense of this is home, and it, and it so instead of this is me, this is home, you get a sense of everywhere is home. And I think that's again, you know, moving from this sense of this this is who I am, this individual body mind, to a more um, universal sense of self, uh, which is in the text several times, but it, I think it's represented in the music a lot by this ever-changing keys, key changing. It's like the Buddhist thing of not self and impermanence. So the key changing gives a sense of impermanence. There's nowhere that you get stuck. You're, all, you're always moving. And it also gives a sense of not self, because I think in music that the, the home key um, gives you a sense of security about, oh, yeah, this is where we are. This is our home territory. We go away, but we come back again. Oh, we're safe, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So I think the key signature changing is another. So uh, those things, I, can, I all arrived at after I'd written the music. Yeah. I didn't have those ideas. And then, you know, it was, it was afterwards looking backwards, trying to understand what the music was.
but you have analyzed it quite well and you have written a, a long piece. It, it, to me, it's, it, I had immediately the impression, but that should be a PhD, you know, this, <laughs> this piece. <laughs> yeah, really, you, have, you have so many explanations for that. So, so you know, why not? Uh, if a different kind, but it is worthwhile. It's not just music. It's, it's also with a with a background in many ways, with integral theory, also how you explained it now with the keys, these things, you know, you, I, uh, you have written that too, no? Many, many, many of these explanations, which are super interesting, which you normally don't get when you go into a concert, you just get the music and not the whole, whole how can you say, uh, the, 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 where it is, where it comes from, where it is embedded, what it means, what it could mean, where, where it leads to, where it points to. And I think it's really more than worthwhile, you know, and I try to get a PhD for that. No, I'm, I'm, well, I'm not, not joking. Uh, I'm really saying that. I thank you very much. I, I, the, I'm very glad that you, you are, that, that side of it is apparent, but um, I, the last thing I want to do is to get a PhD. <laughs> What I want is, what I want is for people to hear the music. I really, I'm not going to go anywhere near a PhD. Uh, I okay. just, that's not my interest. I, what I want is for people to hear the music and for people to be moved by the music. And for people that haven't heard it, don't know anything about Ken Wilbur, don't know anything about the integral model, for them to be, for it to be like a doorway, a gateway. So they hear this piece of music. It's not like anything quite that they've heard before hopefully they're moved in the ways we've talked about with the silence and this sort of guided meditation. And then hopefully they, they're open. Suddenly a doorway is open to a whole new pathway in life that they didn't know existed. That's my hope. <laughs> and uh, I will, I will forego my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just meant it because, you know, we are still living in a society where these things matter. Okay. And then, you know, uh, it might get more attention, you know. <laughs> yeah, I might write a book one day on integral music. Um, yeah, I have, that has that's good. good. That, yeah. yeah, yeah, very but, good. But what's most important is to get this piece out. Because I'm, I'm not yeah. known at all as a composer. I'm no one. And I've written a lot of mm -hmm. songs in the past, but no one knows me as a composer. So my real challenge, and it's not an easy one, is to get this piece listened to. Yes. which you know, performed and we hope we can uh, have done our part today and then on the conference we will have yeah. other possibilities to inspire people to to go yeah. to your website stevebanks.info is the yeah. website and, and if anyone listening does have a listen to the piece please send me an email and you know give me some give me feedback about what you've experienced i, I really appreciate it and if anyone's got any ideas about um financial sponsorship for the world premiere in a year's time i would be very grateful to hear from people <laughs> i you know i really need to raise quite a lot of money what about do you think what will that cost uh, orchestra and all it's that the, the very rough terms is um to record the performance as well something like twenty thousand pounds so mm -hmm. what would twenty five thousand euros mm -hmm. Something yeah. like that. It's yeah. not a huge sum of money, but, no, but still. I, you know, it's significant. We have to inspire people who are interested in new ways of mu writing music and also of the use of music. You know, it's not just for, you know, sitting in the concert hall with the uh, fur things and the uh, necklaces, but that has a meaning more than the aesthetic. Um, component so. absolutely yeah so i mean we have um you know when when i was reading ken's works i soon became aware of stuart davis uh, do you know stuart davis yes sir. fantastic singer songwriter i love his music kid his album kid mystic if anyone's not heard that i really recommend it fantastic um uh, singer songwriter so, um, integrally integrally inspired and okay. also have uh, brooke mcnamara who i met at the conference mm -hmm. in 2018 who's doing she's got a great book of poetry out um, again in, she's a she's um training in zen to become a zen teacher or maybe she already is anyway her she's got a great book of poetry out i can't remember the title but brooke mcnamara she was at the shoot 
directors at the conference. So we have, and we have um, Alex Gray in terms of visual art, mm -hmm. and and the other, um, uh, oh, I've forgotten her name, Baird, Jennifer Baird in the UK. She's a, another painter who's painting integrally informed painting. She's going to be at the conference in uh, this May, and Gaia is another painter. Those two of them are, are facilitating the visual art exhibition mm -hmm. at the. Um, so we have these, you know, integral artists working in visual arts, in poetry, singer-songwriter with Stuart Davis. But uh, um, if there's any more classical composers listening to this who are, who are working, you know, integrally informed, I'd be very glad to be in touch. Yeah. So, but I think for the, my impression from the conferences is that, you know, Integral has made its biggest impact so far in terms of personal development and spiritual development and organizational. Those are the biggest areas. Um, and it's the, the cult, the artistic cultural side is a bit behind in some sense. Yes. So I, you know, I hope that this piece can be, be, uh, an ambassador for Integral, you know, in that cultural sphere. Yeah, wonderful. So we we will meet. I thank you very much for this conversation, and we will meet in Hungary. And yeah. hopefully, many people who are listening to that get inspired first of all to listen, and then take part in crowdfunding, <laughs> and then also come to the conference and meet yeah, us. Great. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed the conversation. It's been, and also actually, I've I've um, I've learned some new things about my piece by talking to you. So <laughs> that is good. <laughs> that's been very helpful. Okay, thank you. Thank you.